Uh, welcome again to uh, Marquette University Law School, the Lubar Center at Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, or people we like to say are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. <coughs> Today we are joined by Megan Tui. She is an investigative reporter with the New York Times, whose focus and her attention has been on, on the treatment of women and children. Uh, Megan Tui is uh, part of a team at the New York Times that recently won a Pulitzer Prize for public service. They're reporting on the issue of sexual harassment in a number of industries, but in particular, one, one of the things we'll be talking about today is they're reporting on Harvey Weinstein, the uh, well-known, uh, at least in Hollywood circles, uh, movie producer who uh, faced uh, allegations of decades of sexual abuse. Again, the reporting on that story and the reporting on sexual harassment uh, won Megan and uh, the team at the New York Times a Pulitzer. Uh, it also led, and I think we could safely say this uh, in some ways, it led to the start of the hashtag MeToo movement, where we've seen other women come forward and tell their stories of sexual harassment or sexual abuse in the workplace. Uh, Megan Tui is a veteran reporter. She has worked not only for the New York Times, but also for Reuters, for the Chicago Tribune, and for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. <laughs> See, they like that. Yeah. <laughs> We are delighted that she's with us today. This event is being co-sponsored by the Milwaukee Press Club. And we should mention that tonight, Megan and her reporting colleague, Jody Cantor, will be honored uh, for their work on the Weinstein investigation. They will receive the Press Club's uh, very prestigious Sacred Cat Award. So congratulations <laughs> on that. So again, please welcome Megan Tui to Marquette University Law School. Before we talk about the Weinstein investigation, I want to take you back about 10 or 12 years to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel newsroom Yeah, and, and talk about what you learned in that experience. What was that experience like for you and what did you learn then that you're putting used to today? Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, I have such fond memories of the four years that I spent here in Milwaukee. It was my first newspaper job, and I'm forever grateful to uh, Marty Kaiser and George Stanley, who hired me, who took a chance on uh, you know, a 20-something kid who was uh, had a little bit of experience, but still a lot to learn. I started off in the Racine County Bureau of the Milwaukee mm -hmm. Journal Sentinel, and I was <laughs> I'd grown up, I grew up in Evanston outside Chicago, and I was driving into town this morning with my parents uh, and driving through Racine County and having memories of the stories that I did starting off there where I was really a general assignment reporter. I covered everything from the county fair to uh, actually I was driving past the, when we were driving past the, uh, there was a, there's a golf club that's uh, right off the highway, South Hills Country Club, I right. think. Yep. If I, yeah, I, I think my very first story for the newspaper was about the fact, it was a controversy at the country, at the, at the golf course because the, there, there were companies or there were men who were businessmen who were doing uh, deals on the golf course who had brought in strippers. And so it's, <laughs> I was thinking that, uh, and, and, and it was sort of one of many stories that I wrote over my time here that kind of intersected with uh, issues of sex and power and even at my going away party at the New York Times, one of the editor, excuse me, at the Journal Sentinel, one of the editors joked that I had uh, that I had managed to sort of turn in one story after another about about related to sex, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which I think gave them a little bit of a headache at times. Like, why does she keep writing about this? And what I'd say today, and I said this yeah. earlier when we were chatting before coming in, is that I quickly gravitated to stories that appeared to be about abuse of power. Uh, you know, once I kind of figured out some of the ABCs of journalism. I I kind of I began to gravitate towards uh, stories that required some more digging, uh, looking at institutions of power and whether or not they were abusing those positions of power. There were, uh, at the time, one of the, the stories, I, I did a story about, um, there were questions about how the prison system was treating pregnant you know, women, it, pregnant inmates. Uh, there were, um, I did a lot of stories about the higher education system here in Wisconsin. Uh, there were, it was, it, I just can't speak highly enough about the, uh, you know, the, the, the education, the journalism education I got here in four years, uh, covering a variety of subjects. Let's fast forward uh, to October 
of, of 2017 and, and the Harvey Weinstein story. You told me upstairs that that was your first day back after maternity leave. They said, work on this with Jody Cantor. That's right. Tell us how the Weinstein story came to be. So I was, I joined the New York Times two years ago. I was by that point doing kind of full-time investigative reporting. And the, the, the New York Times hired me during the presidential race to come in and do investigative digging on the candidates. And it was, uh, I, I quickly ended up reporting on Trump and women, his treatment of women, um, which had emerged as one of the, the issues, uh, one of the more pressing issues during the campaign. And so right away I had, um, I ended up working with and doing stories about women who came forward during the race with allegations of sexual misconduct against Trump. And it was a very different it was a very different experience than the Weinstein reporting. At that time, we were, you know, the Trump um, and many of his supporters really went on the counterattack in the face strong of those pushback. stories. There was mm -hmm. a really big, there was a strong pushback. Mm -hmm. The, uh, you know, he criticized, uh, he called his accusers liars. He, um, he called, uh, you know, he threatened to sue them. He threatened to sue the New York Times. He threatened to sue me. Uh, one, in one of the co interviews we had when I was presenting with him with allegations uh, that uh, some of these women were making, he, you know, com started screaming at me and called me a disgusting human being. And it was a very, uh, it, it, it was very interesting to do the stories with these allegations of sexual uh, harassment and sexual misconduct um, against him in 2016, and uh, we know how that story ended. They didn't; those those allegations didn't stop him from being elected and uh, elected president. And um, I kind of slinked off to maternity leave. Uh, I had been pregnant during the race and and had a baby, and uh, so I kind of retreated from journalism for for about four months while. I was tending to a newborn, you know, drowning in diapers and dirty diapers and sleepless nights. But while I was gone, something interesting happened at the New York Times. Uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Emily Steele and Mike Schmidt, had, uh, unbeknownst to me, been for months and months investigating Bill O'Reilly, the um, who at that point was probably the most powerful conservative, uh, cable television, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, figure mm -hmm. in conservative uh, media. And uh, what they had discovered in the course of their reporting was they had identified a financial trail of misconduct uh, going back years, stretching back years. He had paid tens of millions of dollars to women who had come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against him to silence them and cover up that trail of wrongdoing. And they had been able to sort of piece that together to identify the, the, these, these astronomical payments that had been made to, to women. And, and they, about this time last year, broke that story. And it was remarkable what happened next. Uh, the, uh, you know, the public was outraged, Ad Fox advertisers were outraged, and he was fired. He had to leave Fox. And I kind of watched this with interest uh, from maternity leave, thinking, wow, this is interesting. This type of reporting can, can have an impact like this. And at the New York Times, the editors and reporters were sitting down and saying, well, this is interesting. Are there other powerful men who have faced similar allegations of sexual misconduct and been, been able to cover it up through settlements or other efforts you know, to, to conceal their wrongdoing? And if so, how can we go out and find those stories? And so at that time, it was about this time last year, that the New York, there was an, that an investigative unit team at the New York Times formed to go deeper and, and wider on the issue of sexual harassment. And Harvey Weinstein was somebody who had long been rumored to be a sexual predator. And uh, there, there had been other news organizations that tried and failed to, to get the story, to, to get to the bottom of what had really happened with him behind closed doors uh, with the many actresses and, and female employees in his companies over the years. And this, we saw this moment at the New York Times taking on this broader issue of sexual harassment, that this was really the time to, to apply some real investigative muscle to seeing if there was truth to those rumors. And so my colleague Jody Cantor actually called me while I was on maternity leave. She was the one who had, uh, you know, who, who had been first um, 
assigned to, to start probing uh, Weinstein. And so she called me up on maternity leave and said, we didn't even know each other at the time. And she said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to sort of, I'm, I'm peering up the mountain of this investigation that I'm starting on the film producer Harvey Weinstein, and I have to start calling these many women in Hollywood and to see if they'll talk to me about their experiences with him. And I don't know what to say to them. I don't know how do you get women to go on the record about their experiences of such intimate and in some many ways like such traumatic experiences. And she knew that I had done the Trump reporting and that I had worked with a lot of women who had come forward during the campaign. And so she called me up and said, do you have any advice on how to go about making these phone calls? And what kind of pitch do you make to women? And I said, listen, you know, what, what's worked for me is, is saying, listen, we can't changed what's happened to you in the past, but if you work with me, if you tell the truth about what had happened, maybe we can turn this collective, maybe we can turn your private pain into some collective strength that can help make a difference here. And so uh, when I returned from maternity leave, the editor said, you know, you can go back to reporting on Trump or you can join this Weinstein investigation. And I just, having cared about this issue and having done this type of reporting in the past, I felt like even as challenging as I knew it was going to be, I just couldn't say no. I, I couldn't say no. And there was also a part of me that knew that because there had been other news organizations and reporters that had tried and failed to do it, my I have a real competitive streak. And so I thought, um, all right, like let's you know, I'll, let's let's rise to the challenge. Let's let's really see if we can do what no one else has done. And that's that's how it began for us. How hard was the reporting? Because as you point out, there have been these rumors in the past. I think even uh, David Carr with the New York Times had wanted to report this story, but he could not get people to go on the record to verify these allegations. So how hard was it to to get them to do what the women in the Trump case had done? Right. Well, we realized very from the very beginning, Jody and I realized that how hard this was going to be. Once we did set out to start interviewing women, once we started making phone calls and knocking on people's doors, you know, we were reaching out to extremely famous people in Hollywood. We were also reaching out to people who had served as lowly secretaries in the companies that he ran over the years, from Miramax in the 1990s up through the Weinstein Company uh, that operated, you know, up through. Uh, it's only. I mean, it's it, it's crumbling now, but in the face of what's happened. At, we really we realized in, in our initial conversations with women, uh, there were many people who just refused to talk to us. There were other people who did start to tell us the experiences that they had had with him off the record. And it was remarkable to see how even from the, the, you know, the lowly secretaries up through these famous women in Hollywood, people who I would think would never be scared to kind of tell the truth about what had happened to them, given their celebrity, given their money, were terrified to, to, to go on the record. They said, listen, Harvey Weinstein is somebody who has been able to make and break careers in Hollywood. He is known for using threats. He is known for using intimidation. And we are, we, we are confident that we will be the ones to suffer if we go on the record and tell our stories about him. And so we realized, Jody and I realized, you know, within weeks of our reporting that, that we weren't, that's not the way we were going to be able to get to the finish line. That we were never going to be able to get to the point where we had a story we could publish in the New York Times by relying on the he said, she said model of reporting on sexual harassment or sexual abuse. That we were going to have to find other ways uh, to, to build a comprehensive and sound story. Uh, the, and, and, and there were a couple ways that we went about that. You, you know, I brought up, I, you know, I referenced our colleagues, Mike Schmidt and Emily Steele, who had done the Bill O'Reilly story. They had done something really significant with this type of reporting. These settlements that are paid, you know, these, these out-of-court settlements that are paid to women who come forward with allegations against powerful men had been used as a way to uh, silence the women and cover up wrongdoing. And they realized that you could actually reverse engineer them. And that if you were able to actually document these payments that had been made over the years repeatedly, and if you were able to figure out the, the, the dollar amounts that had been spent, that that alone could serve as pretty 
pretty um, irrefutable evidence of, of, of wrongdoing or certainly a pattern of questionable behavior. And so we, one of the things that we did with the, with the Weinstein reporting was that we started to uh, figure out, we, we, he was somebody else who had made right. uh, struck settlements with as many as 12 women over the years. And so what we did, as we, in addition to starting to kind of gather the stories of, of various women, we started to try to nail down the evidence of the settlements that he had paid over those years. Uh, we also worked to extract internal records from the company, uh, the companies that he had ran. There had been junior executives uh, in the company who had come forward over the years to make complaints about his behavior. Uh, in 2015, there was a junior executive, Lauren O'Connor, who had in, well, in 2013, she'd actually gone to the HR department to complain about him. She said, listen, his behavior is so troubling that I'm scared to travel with him. And the response from HR was, well, come back to us when he crosses the line physically. And two years later, she went back to HR with an extremely detailed memo of rampant, you know, allegations of rampant sexual harassment by him. And so we were ultimately in the course of pounding the pavement and doing these different approaches to our reporting, we were able Able to extract her memo from the inside the company. And so along the way, we built, built out this uh, body of evidence that we could use in our story that was not just, that was basically helped to provide a kind of legally sound, safe space in which women could then, we could go back to women and say, you know, please come onto the yeah, record we've now. This we've got there. this. You're not going to be alone. You're not going to just be out on a limb in a he said, she said scenario with Harvey Weinstein. You will be doing it with this this other body of evidence you know, beneath you, and so that that was that was something that proved really effective, I think, for us. How important was it for the actress uh, Ashley Judd to come forward and say, <laughs> "Yes, I'm willing to put my name on this. You can quote me." It was extremely significant. It was it was extremely significant, and I think we were at um, within weeks of I can't I, I think it was within weeks of publishing our first story on October fifth of 2017, we were at um, a Women in Media uh, awards dinner where she got an award for being a named source in a story, which we as journalists were just thrilled to see, uh, you know, the, the, that the world would start to acknowledge what a big deal it is for people who do step forward uh, and sort of against all odds that, that, that this is gonna be something that's beneficial to them personally, that they're gonna potentially suffer damage to their careers and personal attacks for, for being a name source in a story, and yet they still do it, uh, was just thrilling for us to watch and we're forever grateful for her. It, it, it was, I think that, that that was, I mean, we were gonna publish a story without, you know, with, with, without her, without any famous women at that, we were prepared to do that at that point. We thought we had a strong story, but I think that, it, that, that she really helped break the dam. And it was within a matter of days that these other women in Hollywood, who I think had been too, you know, who had been scared to go on the record, said, okay, if she can do it, I can too. It, you wrote a story not too long after the first story about uh, Weinstein's, uh, um, I don't know, web of complicity, the, the people who helped him keep these, uh, allegations out of the media to, for the most part, I mean, there were rumors, but I saw an interview with his wife this past week who said she thought she had a happy marriage. She didn't know he was involved in these things. Clearly, he had a, as you've discussed earlier, he had a network of various individuals who helped protect this other side yeah. of Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. So that's a, and, and that's a good point. I would say that it was a huge, we felt like it was a huge victory to publish our first story on October 5th in which we were able to document decades of allegations of sexual misconduct against him and really start to identify him as the kind of alleged predator that he was. But we didn't stop at, with publishing that first story. As investigative reporters, we really feel like it's our job to to not just identify the, the bad actions of a particular individual, but to go beyond that and ask the even harder and sometimes tougher questions of the, the real moral horror of the, 
of the Harvey Weinstein story was that he had been able to get away with this for 40 years. And so we wanted to know, how was he able to get away with it? Who were the individuals and institutions that enabled his predatory behavior and were complicit over the years? And so we went, you know, after October 5th, we went right back to our desks and uh, our reporting pads and continued to press forward with those questions to see who else had been involved in what was this complicity machine that had helped enable his bad behavior over the years. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it, it was remarkable what we discovered. There were these high-powered attorneys from, you know, David Boies had been celebrated as this um, kind of legal liberal lion who same had marriage, had, yeah. who mm -hmm. had once right. the same-sex marriage case before the Supreme Court. Uh, he, well, you know, he had been by Harvey's Harvey Weinstein's uh, side for for decades and had uh, we he was among the the, the very high-powered attorneys who had swooped in when women did step forward over the years to make allegations against him that organized and orchestrated the, the settlements that were used to silence them. There were the HR departments that looked the other way when employees stepped forward to say that they were scared of, of, of Weinstein, that were more intent on protecting the, the predatory boss than they were on protecting the employees. There were the talent agencies in Hollywood that were uh, continued to send the actresses into private meetings with him in hotel rooms, even when their clients reported back having it's disturbing encounters with him. There were the the, the Democratic Party. You know, uh, Harvey Weinstein had long been aligned with the Clintons. Uh, he had been he had helped fundraise. You know, he had been one of their biggest fundraisers, and in turn had enjoyed the feminist cred that Hillary Clinton provided to him. Uh, that it, I think, President helped. President Obama's yeah, daughter interned. President Obama's daughter, Harvey yeah, Weinstein. Malia interned at the Weinstein Company. And what we realized was that that, al that al alliance had continued even after uh, multiple people had had warned Hillary's campaign that that Harvey was a sexual predator. Uh, and so this was, you know, we there were news organizations that were supposed to be covering Weinstein who cozied up to him instead, who took book deals and, and, and TV deals and, and, and didn't ask the tough questions even when they were dangling there in plain sight. And so we really felt like that was, that that was just as, that that was just as important as sort of uh, identifying his bad behavior was to figure out the, the systemic flaws uh, and the individuals and institutions that had enabled it. It was interesting to see his reaction um, to these allegations. And, and to me, it struck me as it sort of varied. Uh, he had people like Lisa Bloom, uh, the attorney, interesting, sort of ironic, but Lisa Bloom defending him as a, an old dinosaur who was learning new ways. Then you had, then you had, but then you had uh, uh, the, the issue of, well, some of these relationships were consensual or some of them didn't happen the way they're described. It was very interesting to see the reaction when, when he was sort of questioned about what all of these women were saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, well, Lisa Bloom was among, by the time we were preparing to publish, Weinstein had assembled a... Uh, a, a very large kind of army to fight back our story. And it included David Boies, it included Lisa Bloom, who as the daughter of Gloria Allred had really mm -hmm. um, presented herself over the years as a big uh, advocate of victims of sexual misconduct, um, somebody who was determined to hold uh, you know, powerful men accountable. You know, she was on Harvey's team. Uh, there were uh, there were other high-powered lawyers and publicists. Charles Harder, who had the attorney who had succeeded in suing Gawker out of existence, was uh, by Harvey's side threatening to sue the New York Times if we move forward with our story. And so it was um, it, it, it was a it was a formidable uh, it was a formidable group that we were squaring off against in the final final days and weeks of our of our reporting. And I think that the response that followed, there were, it was a very sort of schizophrenic response that he presented us with. Yeah. On the one hand, Charles Harder was threatening to sue us if we move forward with the story. On the other hand, Lisa Bloom was saying, right. well, you know, Harvey just, you know, he's, he, is, he is a man of a certain generation mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, who, who may, you know, 
didn't do anything illegal, but now realizes that he took advantage of the power dynamic and but you know that everything was consensual. Uh, it just was a uh, sort of imbalanced power dynamic. And I think that there were that was something that that was that that was a line we heard moving forward that the whole New York Times heard moving forward with these other stories. I mean, what we've realized in the last six months is that this wasn't the behavior of a single bad apple, that there were powerful men in a variety of industries that were, uh, you know, that, that were able to, to, to get away with these patterns, very similar patterns of, of predatory behavior, and that there were institutions and individuals that looked the other way. And that it wasn't just men of a certain generation, <laughs> that these were, there were young men in Silicon Valley who were engaging in the same types of, 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 of predatory behavior and, 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 and looking to sort of cover it up and explain it away in similar manners. And that I think that what, one of the things that we've realized is that this would just, that just, it's just been stunning, even for us who were kind of in the forefront of the reporting, just didn't, I mean, our, our you know, there were so many times that we were shocked to just see how prevalent this was and how it stretched into like all these different industries with you know people, men of all different ages and um, you know victims from all different backgrounds. I, I I never expected that somebody like that some of these famous women in Hollywood would be would be scared to go on the record. I mean it, it it's just it it was it it, it really was remarkable at every turn what we what we what we encountered take take me uh, back to about a week before the story was published so did you have any idea that it would blow up the way it did and I asked that for a couple of reasons first of all because Harvey Weinstein while he was certainly a well-known figure in Hollywood was not a household name in America I think it's safe to say and secondly there's this attitude about well that's Hollywood that's you know what goes on in Hollywood doesn't really reflect what goes on in our lives it's different in in middle America than it is out there were you surprised at the way the story resonated with so many people? Well, I can tell you that in the course of our reporting, over and over again, Jody and I would hear the same line from men and women. They'd say, you know, listen, first of all, you're never going to be able to get to the finish line. You're never going to be able to publish your story. Harvey's going to come into the New York Times, and he's going to bully the, your editors, and he's going to threaten, and he's going to intimidate, and he's going to kill the story the way he has at every single other news organization that's tried to do this story. And, uh, and even if you do succeed, even if you do publish, even if you do, you know, finally publish your little story, nobody's going to care. And Did they really, say they that? really said they really said story, that. Yeah, your little no story. Even if care. you do it, like nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to care. This is how it's. This is just how it's done. This is how it's always been done in Hollywood. The casting couch is old news. Everybody knows that 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 that, that this is this is that this is what men do, and nobody's going to care. And this is just how it is. Not just in Hollywood, but this is just how it is in life, ladies. So, don't 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 waste your time. And obviously, we. We ignored that and uh, pressed forward with our reporting. But even in those final days, there was a moment when we were driving home from the, Jody and I work at the New York Times in Manhattan, um, but we both live in Brooklyn. And we were taking a cab back to Brooklyn at like 1 o'clock in the morning, bleary-eyed, the night before we published. And I turned to Jody and I said, do you think anybody's going to care? Do you think any, so do you think, any, do you think anybody's going to read this story? And uh, <laughs> which is not, it's not uncommon for journalists when they're, they've just been living and breathing the reporting for so many months to, to lose perspective and not know how it's going to go over once you finally publish it in the papers, in, in the pages of the paper. But uh, I, I knew at that point that we had enough damning evidence <coughs> that he was not going to be able to keep his job. But we did have concerns about what the, broader interest was going to be in this story and in this individual in this particular individual did any did people know who Harvey Weinstein was people knew who Bill O'Reilly was but did people know who this film producer was and i think that so to answer your question we had i i can safely say that we we really had no idea that it was going to help spark this broader reckoning over sexual harassment and that it was going to land with such force and i think that we're still trying to sort of di we're still trying to unpack exactly why it was that this particular um, that these particular stories um, 
helped create such broad ripple effects. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm so interested because you did the reporting on Donald Trump and, and some of the accusations that were made in that, uh, as you pointed out earlier, he disputed them, he was elected president, and yet less than a year later, people believed the mm -hmm. accusers. People said, this is important, this matters. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about what changed so quickly and so dramatically in that short period of time? Well, I think that to, I mean, I, I, I think to go back to Trump as somebody who was in the thick of the, the, the coverage of Trump's treatment of women during the campaign <coughs> and had kind of um, uh, retreated after the election with this belief that nobody cared about those women's stories, I think I was wrong. I, I think that the, you know, you saw it in the women's marches that happened after his election, the hundreds of thousands of women and men who took to the streets. I mean, there were a variety of messages in those marches, but I think that one of them was, actually, we do care about these allegations, and we do have a problem with somebody being uh, in the White House who has been, who has faced, you know, there were more than 10 women who came forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against him, and I think that there was rage among certain demographics in the country uh, following his election that didn't go away and continued to simmer below the surface. And so when there were other stories that uh, that, that, that broke um, over this past year in his first year in office uh, that about similar types of behavior. Um, uh, well, in, 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 in this behavior, there's a range to this behavior. So I don't want to. I don't want to clump everyone yeah. together. Um, but you know, I think that that I think that there. I think that Trump's presidency had set the stage for at least in certain demographics um, an outrage that was ready to be unleashed when these additional when these other stories about O'Reilly about Weinstein uh, and about other powerful men who had sort of you know allegedly abused that power to prey on young women uh, surfaced and I but I don't think that that I think that's one of the reasons that the that that we that we saw this broader kind of reckoning on sexual harassment emerge over the past year uh, I think that in the case of Weinstein there was also an interesting what made the Weinstein story interesting is that for the first time, this was a story in which some of the accusers were more famous than the yeah. accused. That and and for so many years in these types of stories, you know, the women who stepped forward were. I mean, it was really it could be really messy for them. They were, uh, you know, they they had to be prepared to be personally attacked themselves, uh, to be smeared. And uh, I think that for them, there was also just oftentimes uh, some, f some feelings of shame, that they were embarrassed and, and, and made to feel sh you know, shamed over what had happened. Uh, it's a big deal stepping forward to share these intimate, you know, often uh, th these violations that you've experienced in such an intimate way. And I think that a lot of women were just said, "Listen, I, there's too much shame and danger to do this. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not. No way. No way am I gonna step into the national spotlight and and undergo that type of scrutiny and 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 embarrassment and shame. And I think that when there were famous women in Hollywood who stepped forward and said, no, "Actually, this has happened to me." and I'm gonna be brave enough to speak out about it, I think that that started to kind of change the image uh, and, and, and the conversation um, and uh, around what it means to step forward and, and share these stories. So, so we have the, this Me Too movement, which emerges after this, and we, and we have, it seems like every other day or every week, there's another story of a man who's behaved badly, uh, you know, uh, done the really, um, terrible things in the workplace. So you go through the Charlie Roses and the Matt Lowers and the comedians like Louis C.K., uh, actors like Kevin Spacey, uh, an awful lot of people. They're all famous people. So the question I have, has, has Me Too uh, changed the lives of everyday people, the people who just go to work every day but are not famous or don't deal with famous people? Has it reached that level? No, what I, I think that the the effects of this particular moment, this particular movement, are ongoing, and we can't, we don't know the answer yet how this is going to affect uh, the, you know, the variety of workplaces across the country. What I can tell you is that the New York Times uh, recognized right away that we didn't want to just tell the stories of 
of, of famous people, that this, we knew that this wasn't limited to, to celebrity, this wasn't limited to Hollywood, this wasn't even limited to the media industry. And so if you look back at the coverage that the New York Times has done over the past uh, six to eight months that was, you know, that we were so grateful to be, rec that was in fact recognized by the Pulitzer Committee, what you'll see is actually a, a stories that really touched on a variety of, of industries and workplaces. We had my colleagues, you know, went to Chicago where there was a Ford plant, right. you know, these Ford right. plants that had, where, where the female employees had been suffering uh, rampant sexual harassment, even after the EEOC came in to supposedly clean up the mess. And there were, you know, we, my other colleagues did stories on the restaurant industries, you know, the, the, you know, waiters and waitresses who were, felt like it was just expected that they uh, submit to and suffer through sexual harassment uh, in order to make a living. And so we really have felt uh, very strongly about the need to push into a variety of industries and workplaces that go be, you know, that in which you've got like lower wage workers uh, suffering through many of the same things that as these sort of famous women in Hollywood. And, you know, I think that if 2000, um, you know, I think if last year was about kind of starting to, to pull the curtain uh, off of the individual predators and in all these various workplaces, you know, moving forward this year, the, 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 the job of not just journalists, but, but, but companies and workplaces across America is to figure out what the real solutions are. If there were systemic failures that had allowed this type of predatory behavior to, to kind of uh, take place unchecked in a variety of workplaces, what are some of the systemic solutions that can be put in place to make sure that all employees are protected moving forward? This is a question I'm sure you've been asked before, but, but I'll ask it any, anyway. Um, is it possible for the Me Too movement to go too far? And, and by that, you made an interesting point <coughs> earlier that there are different degrees of what has transpired. There may be something in, that happened with Garrison Keillor that is inappropriate, and then there's something that happened with Harvey Weinstein, which mm -hmm. goes well beyond uh, mm -hmm. inappropriate. Um, that being a, a concern. Um, and then in this world that we live in where it's a very competitive media world, are you concerned that some news organizations may not vet allegations in the same way your organization mm -hmm. vetted mm -hmm. them? Yeah. Well, I think it's important. I'd like to just kind of take a moment to talk about the vetting that yeah. goes into these stories because it requires a tremendous amount of work. I think the fact that so many news organizations had tried and failed to, to do the Harvey Weinstein story before is, is actually a testament to how rigorous this process is. You know, at the, if, at the New York Times, our editors were very explicit with us. They didn't want anonymous sources. They didn't want our stories to be a place where people could go and make accusations, very serious accusations against somebody without using their name and without providing us kind of the, the tools we need to corroborate those claims. And so if you look back at the stories that the New York Times has done on sexual harassment and sexual abuse, you, you don't see anonymous sources. Or you rarely see anonymous sources. So for us, it was always, there were sort of several different, um, there were several different rules that we applied to, the, to our reporting on this extremely sensitive issue. One was to get people on the record with their names. Uh, the second was, you know, what, what can we do to corroborate these claims? Are there, were these things, were the complaints ever put in writing? Were they ever put into complaints that were filed inside the companies? Were there ever complaints that were made to the police? Are there records of these financial settlements that have been paid? If so, we need to, to obtain those and we need to be able to make sure that our, that our stories basically are, you know, stand on the, the evidence of these, of these records, of these documents out there. Uh, if there weren't records, you know, were there, were, did the people who suffered these violations speak out to anybody at the time? Did they, did they tell their friends? Did they tell their family about what had happened? And if so, we want to talk to that family member. We want to talk to that friend. We want to do extensive interviews and make sure that these stories line up. And so there are, and, and all of that is 
requires a lot of work. And so even after we broke the Weinstein story and the floodgates opened, I mean, the New York Times became like a national hotline for complaints. There were women from around the country who were writing in with these heartbreaking stories of abuse and harassment. And we didn't, we could barely keep up with it. We had to kind of create like a triage system to basically start to figure out ways in which other reporters could start to do, take up these allegations and investigate them. You know, what started as a project by the investigative team at the New York Times quickly turned into a newsroom-wide uh, reporting effort. There were, you know, today you've got reporters from the culture desk, from sports, from the metro desk, from the business desk, from the media department. Uh, have basically gotten a crash course in how to do this very difficult reporting. And even once the floodgates opened, even after we had sort of more allegations and, and sort of compelling stories than we could keep up with, we still didn't turn around and like quickly put those stories in the paper. We still applied all of that extremely rigorous due diligence. And actually, when I look around, when I look at the other news organizations that, that jumped on this, yeah, I always say, like, mm -hmm. listen, there are stories that you that news organizations and journalists want to hoard. Right, you know, you break a hot story, and you don't want anybody else to touch it. You know, you want the New York Times, and you, you know, you specifically as a journalist to just own the story and every aspect of it moving forward. You know, for those of us who care about sexual harassment and sexual abuse, like this was not one of those stories. We were so thrilled to see so many other news organizations, different types of news organizations, from like the Hollywood Reporter, you know, to the Washington Post, to the Wall Street Journal, to uh, these, you know, to regional papers that were uh, that sort of quickly rose to the occasion and started doing, you know, telling other stories um, about this important subject. And and when I look around and when I see all the different journalists and the news organizations. That have stepped in, you know. I have uh, I have extremely admired like ninety nine percent of of the yeah. coverage that 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 followed. Mm -hmm. um, your life has changed a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, uh, there's going to be a book uh, about this. You and uh, uh, Jody Cantor are going to write a book. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil your or, or give your publisher a, a heart attack, but can you give us some broad parameters sure, of what you're sure, sure, going yeah. to be talking about in your book? <laughs> yeah, so we realized, Jody and I realized, when we finally kind of came up for a breath of air after these extremely intense months, as I mentioned, I did this, I started the Weinstein reporting my first day back from maternity leave, and so uh, I was working around the clock on this investigation as it got more and more heated, um, and in so, you know at, at certain points kind of a little scary, um, uh, while also juggling my first experience with a baby. And uh, but it was it was it, that actually ended up being one of the things that really propelled me forward through the hard work. Um, I have a now 14-month-old daughter, uh, and it was as hard as it was to, to return to the office after being home with her, to leave her at home you know, with a nanny for the first time and walk out the door and, and know I wouldn't be coming back until you know, later that night. I really felt that that she was a motivation to move forward with this reporting. You know, I'd say to her, even though she obviously couldn't and still can't talk yet. But um, you know, I would say to her, I, and I, I, this is probably a conversation I was having just as much with myself as I was for her. But you know, listen, I need you know, in those first weeks when I bet, when I went back, I'd say like, you know, listen, I need you to behave. You know, mom's going off to do the work on this very important story that will hopefully make the world safer for, for little you. girls like you. Yeah. And I need you to do your part in this effort. <laughs> and, <laughs> How'd that work? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm, I'm like, wait, I think it'll be a decade before I get like any acknowledgement from her that, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, so I, I think that, you know, I just, it was obviously the most, I'd say the most intense um, year of my life, uh, juggling this uh, investigation with the, the first year of parenting. But when we did kind of finally get a moment to come up for air, we realized and we looked around and we took in what had happened more broadly, this, 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 this larger reckoning that's happening over sexual harassment and all of these questions that remain 
mean? I mean, you said in terms of how do you deal with people, you know, the, 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 it's not a, we, I don't think anybody's arguing for a one size fits all solution to a problem that comes with people who have committed a, a, a wide range of violations. There are still, um, I think, I, we, we believe um, that there is still a lot of really important reporting that needs to, to be done on this issue. And so we wanted to, we wanted to keep reporting and we wanted to have a format in which we could write that would really kind of capture, not just continue to probe some of these uh, important questions that remain on the issue of sexual harassment and sexual abuse, but that would also kind of allow us to, to step back and, and tell readers kind of take them on the journey of the investigation with us. So we're, you know, this is a book that's going to basically be kind of inside the reporting, take readers inside the reporting, the Weinstein reporting, and what it was like as we started to, in the course of our investigating, kind of piece together and get glimpses of this, this broader problem and, and, and the issues that, that continue to, to confront us today. And there's talk about a movie. And there's talk about, yes, yeah, there's... <laughs> I'll tell you when I got into you know when I got into to journalism and investigative journalism I never thought that if you told me somebody's going to come to you know, Hollywood's going to come to you and want to do a movie about 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 your reporting and uh, I wouldn't have believed it and uh, but that is indeed what's happened uh, there were we actually fielded a lot of um, a lot of phone calls um, in, 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 in over the past months, and have agreed to we've we've sold the rights to to tell our story. We'll see if it happens. You know, they've optioned the rights to to do kind of a movie like Spotlight, but about the um, about me and my reporter, uh, my excuse me, me and my partner, and it and in our editor. I mean, we re I think that one of the interesting things about this story was that. These were, you know, I'm I obviously I'm 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 a woman, and my reporting partner is a woman, and we worked with uh, our editor on this story, uh, Rebecca Corbett, who's a complete badass, probably one of the biggest badass, you know, uh, uh, editors in the business, is a woman, and we're all the the mothers of of daughters, and the obviously this story really zoomed in on the experiences of women, and so there have been a variety of of, of movies that have been made about journalists over the years, but I think that, that at least the people who bought the rights to tell our story, we'll see if they follow through, seem to think that there, that there might be something special about the, the, the kind of, the, 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 that this was such a, sto a story about women, and so it's so many different levels. And, and a story that's still unfolding. We and, still... and story that's still unfolding. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. For those of you who have not been here before, this is how it works if you're in the seating bowl. There is a black uh, button in front of you. It even says push on it, so push on it, and keep your finger down on it. We'll be able to hear your question. If you're in the back, um, there's Ryan. He has a microphone. He will hold it for you. <clears throat> uh, and if you have a question, please keep it brief, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So we'll uh, move around the room a bit, and uh, I'll start right here. And you want to press down on that. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you. Is it on? Oh, there it is. It okay, is. there it is. Yeah, all right. I think all the reporting is good, and this knowledge is good, and the statistics and all of that are great. But I would like to take it a step further and advocate that in all of this discussion that we talk about women and self-defense and they ought to know how to protect themselves because when it's you and him, it's the gunfight, gunfight at the OK Corral. That's the way it looks. And if we knew how to, you know, a guy touches you, you take his fingers and twist them a little bit, and they take their hands off you, and you know how to kick them in the sweet spot. It, you know, I, I think women should know how to defend themselves. And you can go to your local police department, because they have self-training classes. I've taken them. And your local police departments many times offer these twice a year for women. And I think we should be talking about women who can defend themselves when they're alone with these, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. That's my comment. It is a very difficult moment for, for women when it is occurring. What yeah. is the proper response? Yeah, it, I, I mean, to me, the stories of the women who ended up alone with Harvey Weinstein in these hotel rooms, oh. who showed up for meetings to talk about their careers and then faced aggressive advances and, and you know, in, in some cases, allegedly assault and rape, were just heartbreaking, and the various, in, in the course of interviewing women who ended up in those situations, it was heartbreaking to hear the, the different 
the different the different sort of um, tools that they leaned on to try to get out of those rooms before something really bad happened. There were some made jokes. Uh, one woman said that she pulled out her phone and was like, oh, I'm supposed to call my mom, and like actually called her mom while she was in the room. There was a, there was a, a young actress and model in London who posted, who did a post on Instagram about uh, a really scary encounter that she had with Weinstein. She was acting in one of his movies a couple years ago or was being cast in the movie and he invited her and, and into his room and then made this you know, very big aggressive sexual advance on her. And she was so scared about what was about to happen that she started dancing and singing. Like she literally tap danced her way out of the room. And <laughs> for some reason that just, that image I, to me of like the different things that, you know, the different kind of devices that these young women used to try to get out of those rooms was just, and then there were the ones who didn't, there were the ones who didn't get out of the room, right? And, and they're the most heartbreaking of all, but uh, I, I, there was not a single story that, I mean, Harvey Weinstein was a big, big, gruff, like physically big guy. And I think that a lot of women, you know, didn't think that they had a chance of, of actually physically fighting him off, so. Mm -hmm. Let me take other questions. Let me go in the back here, right there. Right, yep, you, and then, then we can go back to Lisa after that. Yes, go ahead. No, actually, we're back here, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question, you, you mentioned the, the bravery of sharing the collective pain. How do you get all of us to understand that versus the rhetoric of it being a witch hunt, you know, for men? I feel like sometimes that gets distorted. So how did the New York Times succeed in keeping that at the forefront of mm -hmm. what he's done to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that that goes back to the really rigorous process that we apply to our reporting and our writing before we publish these stories that, that you are not going to see in the New York Times, um, you know, a woman making a severe allegation without any corroboration or due diligence. Uh, we really make sure that in the process of our reporting that in the case of Weinstein, you know, we went to him as we did with every single man that we've written about um, over the last year and before that. You know, we, 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 make, we go to them and we let them know every single thing that we're preparing to, 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 to report and write on them. And we give them a chance to give us their detailed uh, responses. And it's just a very, very rigorous, I just can't stress enough what the, the rigor of the, the, due, the, due, the due diligence that we, that we do to make sure it's not in anybody's interest for, for, for any of this to be framed as a witch hunt. It's not, that's not what this, that's not what this is about. And, and to, you know, if, if it ever did appear like that was the case, it would do a disservice not only to the people who are being accused, but to the accusers themselves. Lisa. Thank you. This has been really fascinating. I'm Professor Lisa Maisie, and I um, teach here. And one of the things I teach is gender and the law. So this is a very interesting conversation for that. And um, I'm, I've been reading a lot of these the stories that that you and your team have written, and the uh, exploration of the institutional supports that have aided this kind of process. But I'm wondering if you have written or will be writing not just institutionally, how did all this happen? But if we could turn the focus not on you know, what women should have done or what the institution should have done, but on what men themselves need to do to change, to treat women not as objects to be had or used, but as people. Mm -hmm. And when, when and if you're going to, or is that story going to be told? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know what the you know what it's been like for you guys and the conversations that you've had with friends and family and coworkers going back you know over the last six months. But in my experience, they, these are exactly the kind of conversations that are happening. Um, uh, you know, if it, it with you know it drinks at the bar or um, over the breakfast table in homes. I can't tell you the number of women I've spoken to and men who are having these conversations with their sons and their daughters. You know, what does it look like? You know, I think that this has really been a big teaching moment for, for, for families to 
basically seize this chance to have these tough conversations with their their children and say what what does you know what does it look like to 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 you know respect uh, women what does what 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 does consent mean to you what you know at, at 12 and 14 and 18 and beyond like what what is consent and in workplaces i think that we're being confronted with really interesting questions like what what does it look like to, is there space for, for romance to exist in the workplace? What are the power dynamics that, 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 um, that would, would prevent a romantic relationship from happening in the workplace? Can colleagues date or, you know, does there, do, at what point does it cross into a problematic realm where there's a supervisor and, and a subordinate? And so I think that there's, even in my life, the, the last year has brought these very interesting conversations about, um, you know, what, the treatment of, of women um, and sexual dynamics and, and, and beyond. And I think that that's sort of been one of the coolest things to, to experience. It's not necessarily happening. I think it, it, it is happening in the, the, the pages of the, the New York Times. Like yesterday, the, the paper did a story in which it probed what college kids and young folks on what the kind of gray areas of consent. That's not an investigative story, but it's an interesting story that kind of cuts to the heart of some of the questions like that you have and other people, I think, are carrying around with them day in and day out now, mm -hmm. so. Yes. Congratulations, and thank you for your important work. Who would you like to see play you in a movie? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I can't say that I'm, I think as an investigative journalist, I'm at heart a little bit of a, a sort of pessimist, and so I'm not necessarily walking around holding my breath uh, for the, you know, for this movie to be made. If it, if it is made, I'll be, I'll be happy, and I think that beyond who plays us, the various uh, actresses who might be interested in these roles. We're just thrilled at the prospect that there would be, that this, that, 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 that the story behind the story that, that really is, uh, just includes such remarkable courage on behalf of so many women, all of the various sources and others who, who stepped up to this particular moment and said, okay, I'm gonna do this hard work. I'm gonna basically take this leap with you guys and, and go on the record that, you know, we just are, we, we when I think about the, a possible movie, my hope is just that they will be able to uh, tell it as accurately um, uh, as, as it can be told because the truth is, is it was remarkable and those people continue, should the, the heroism that we witnessed in the process of, our, process of our reporting should live on, you know, through, through a movie. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think more about that, but um, it, is, it, is, it is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's awkward it's for you to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, as a, oh, I mean, as a reporter. As a reporter, is, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we just, as I said, you know, yeah. you just never imagined, you know, when I was working in the Racine County Bureau, if you told me that I'd be <laughs> doing the golf I, yeah, course stories. Yeah, when I was, when I was, yeah, when I was reporting on the, the strippers on the golf course, I would, so yeah. I would never have imagined that I'd be here. You know, even just, it's so thrilling to, to be able to talk to audience like you guys, so. Let me take just a couple more questions right there. Yes. <laughs> Ryan, where's Ryan? Uh, I'm going to go over here, I think. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Hang on one second, and we'll uh, get you a microphone. Thanks. Does any of this um, ultimately become criminal charges? That's number one. And the second question is, in terms of publicly held company, and for instance, the Wynn Corporation in Las Vegas, and corporate governance, and um, and sexual harassment, and uh, how a composition of boards. H how does that all play out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're uh, first of all, you know, Weinstein is under investigation in three jurisdictions now for criminal activity. I mean, he's, there, there are criminal probes in New York, in Los Angeles, and in London, and we're tracking all of those and are going to be very curious to see what catches up with him and, and what doesn't. Uh, and so, in, in, 
Uh, so those are, you know, when you talk about the different types of, of uh, sort of predators who have been exposed and how there's not a one-size-fits-all, that, that there's a solution to, to, to the problem. I think, the, you know, Weinstein's the classic example. I mean, he, he has now, an, you know, allegations of rape going back decades and uh, may very well be sent to prison for that. Um, other people who have been accused of... Um, sort of uh, kind of lewd behavior in the workplace uh, to a much lesser extent are obviously not going to end up in the criminal justice system. And that's going to be, they continue to be uh, a problem that uh, companies and boards are going to have to to grapple with. And in the case of Weinstein, we, you know, I talk about how we pressed into the continued pressing forward with tough questions even after we identified his bad behavior going back over the years. And the, the question of the board was one of the things that, that I looked into. Um, and there's still, I mean, at the Weinstein Company, there's been a lot of this in the last, like, six months. Well, like, you know, he, the, the lawyers knew, or the board knew, or the, you know, the president knew, or the different executives knew, or the assistants knew. And everybody's been eager to point the finger at each other. And we're still sorting out kind of who knew what when. Uh, in 2015, there was an, a, an Italian model who went to the police in New York. She had been showed up to Weinstein's office for a business meeting, and within hours went to the police and said, "I was, you know, he he basically tried to sexually assault me, and I'd like to report it." And that case ended up dying without an arrest and without charges. And people are still trying to dissect what happened there. If there was a failure on the part of the criminal justice system to hold him criminally accountable at that point in time. But that happened the year that Weinstein's contract was up for renegotiation at the Weinstein Company, and the board was reviewing his behavior. And they knew what they knew about that complaint. That was the same year that this junior executive that I had mentioned, Lauren O'Connor, went to HR with a lengthy memo detailing rampant sexual harassment by him. Uh, there's I've gotten conflicting accounts of you know, who on the board was aware of settlements that he had struck with women to silence them over the years, how many they were aware of and when. But the bottom line is that there was a lot of evidence that in 2015 that there was something wrong, and the board went ahead and, and, and approved his contract and allowed him to, to carry on. But I do think that these boards have, uh, how was it that, you know, the, the, he was at the, the Weins, Miramax be, got folded into the Disney company for a period of years, and during that time, the allegations against Weinstein continued, and he continued to strike settlements with women who came forward with, with complaints. And when we, you know, in 2017, when we went to Disney, they said, we had no idea, we had no idea. And I just, it, it, there, there's, there's a major problem there, one way or the other, either you're not asking, you know, either you're not paying attention <laughs> to what's going on in your own company, or you are and you're looking the other way. And I think that, that it's really incumbent for all of us to continue to, to, not, just, to not just look at the, the bad behavior of these individuals, but to look at the, the boards, to look at the HR departments, to look at the lawyers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap things up there. We're, uh, we're out of time. But I want to say a couple of things before we go. Number one, Again, uh, Megan Tuohy and her uh, reporting colleague from the New York Times, Jody Cantor, will be honored tonight by the Milwaukee Press Club receiving their Sacred Cat Award. That's a, a wonderful honor, so congratulations on that. I uh, also want to say thank you to the Press Club for uh, co-sponsoring today's event. We're delighted to uh, have that partnership. And again, uh, as I, I do at the end of every one of our events, I want to thank you uh, for being so interested, for your attention, uh, for your good questions. Um, but most of all, as we do at the end of every program. We want to thank our guests, Megan Tuohy, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.